I see people who are 85 years old who start the hacks and a month later they're like, wow, this is the first time I actually feel good in my body ever. Your glucose levels in your body responds instantly to what you do. At no point will what you eat and how you live not impact how you feel. There's not a point where you've gone so far that whatever you do, nothing's going to change. It's not true. Things change instantly. They react to how you eat, how you move, how you manage your stress, how you exercise, how you sleep, who you're around. Like even being around people, you, you feel differently depending on their energy. Well, food goes inside your body. It impacts you immediately. So it's never too late. Um, and please try the hacks. In a couple of days, you'll feel better. I am so freaking excited to be sitting here with you today. I feel like this episode is years in the making. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. I'm so grateful for what you have brought to the world. You have totally changed the world. That is the understatement of the century. You have brought metabolic health and glucose awareness into the zeitgeist like no one else in human history has done. That's just, that's, oh, come that's a fact. On. That's a fact. Oh, come on. That's a fact. I won't take it back. And... Just to share a little bit with the audience who, of course, all know you and love you. You started Glucose Goddess five years ago. Yep. And now have over 3 million people in your community so active, so engaged, learning about glucose management. You've written two books in the past like two and a half years, Glucose Revolution and the Glucose Goddess Method have sold over 1.5 million books, which now that I'm sort of on the book track right now, I'm realizing that that is like the most astronomical yes, feat. but in many different languages. So okay. that helps. Okay. 1.5 <laughs> plus million books, changing people's lives. You have been working on advocacy work. You have literally graced the pages of Vogue, Elle, Bustle, like all these incredible magazines, Good Morning America, TV, radio, looking fabulous while you're doing all of it, making science accessible. Oh, and you're also a math major and a biochemist. It's just, I could go on and on, but I feel so grateful and honored to be here with you today. I feel like I already know you through the internet. I'm so excited to be drinking some vinegar cocktails. I love this cocktail that you made. It's very sweet. I think I don't drink alcohol, so the vinegar cocktails is like my little, you know, fancy, fancy drink. So I love it. Thank you for making it. And thank you for that amazing intro. It's like not even scratching the surface. You also have some super exciting things happening, which we're going to talk about. One is on the table. And by the time this episode comes out, this is going to be in the world. This is the anti-spike formula. We're going to be talking about it during this episode. Curb spikes by like 40%. Yes. This is crazy. So uh, we're going to talk about that too. So anyways, welcome. And let's Thank just you. jump in. Let's do it. Thank you so much. <laughs> so... We have a couple life parallels that I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you know of. One is that I grew up in Georgetown and you got your master's oh, cool. at Georgetown, I didn't know that. which is so fun. So I grew up right next to Georgetown University. But the second fun fact is that I interned at 23andMe in 2009 Wild. because Linda Avey, who yeah. was one of the co-founders, came and spoke in one of my classes at Stanford and it was called Genomics, a Technical and Cultural Revolution. And I literally sat in her lecture and I was like, this is the future. This is everything. I will do anything to work here. And did so you I did like a summer internship I or did. something? I did a summer internship and it was actually all about creating videos for their educational platform to basically wow. help people learn about genetics. And then that is, of course, where you sort worked of worked for five years. But actually, I started years. as an intern as well. So I had the same experience where I had just finished my master's at Georgetown in biochemistry. And I really wanted to go to Silicon Valley where like tech met health. And I was like, ah, this is going to be amazing. And so I had heard about this company, 23andMe, and I really wanted to work there. And I wanted to work on the product team, not on the research side, on like the, you know, interface, website, user experience. And so I begged them for an internship. But they said you're not qualified. We're not hiring. You don't have a visa. So like, no, <laughs> but after enough begging, they gave me a two month summer internship, which then turned into five years. And it was amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Not a five year internship, but they five actually five years of being a senior product <laughs> manager and yeah, doing yeah. all this. That's incredible. Well, I would like to start by talking about genetics since this is a shared passion. A lot of people will say, you know, well, ugh, I'm not going to do these hacks. What I, diabetes runs in my family. Obesity runs in my family, implying that this is sort of predestined and it's genetic. And so I'd be curious to hear from you digging into all the research, like how much really is genetically preordained and how much is 
lifestyle alone? How much is the combination? And then a follow-up question to that is sort of related is there's this big push I'm seeing recently in media and uh, across news channels of obesity being a genetic disease. Dr. Fatima Stanford, uh, who's working on nutritional guidelines, she's an obesity doctor from Harvard, said that literally obesity is a genetic disease. And so what do you think is happening here with this new movement towards that? If we say that diabetes and obesity are genetic diseases, that is ignoring just a mountain of evidence showing us that's not the case. So when somebody says diabetes runs in my family, therefore it must be genetic, you also have to remember that one thing that you inherit from your parents is not just your genes, but it's also your lifestyle, your habits, uh, your socioeconomic status, what you're used to eating, what you can eat, what you can afford to eat, etc. From my work at 23 Me, yes, we did see that there were some genes that increased your likelihood of type 2 diabetes or of obesity, but these account for a very small fraction of why you actually get the disease. Now, let me give you a few examples. So from twin studies, so we take identical twins, same genetic code, okay, exactly the same genetic code. It is very possible that one of the two twins will get type 2 diabetes and the other one won't. So just from that alone, you can understand that it's not clearly not 100% genetic. Then another one that's interesting is that type 2 diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, right? And now even kids are getting it. But our genes haven't changed in 20 years, but this has changed, okay? And then finally, if it's a genetic disease, then why is it possible to reverse it when you change your lifestyle? So I think that is unfortunately something a lot of people hear and it can feel quite depressing if you get the disease and you're told it's just genetic, there's nothing you can do about it. I think it's very clear now and there's so much evidence that shows us that we can change our outcomes when it comes to type 2 diabetes. And yes, it is difficult. It requires changing what you eat, how you eat. For many people, they don't have access to healthy foods. It's very difficult, but it is not a genetic disease. It is definitely a lifestyle disease. If you've heard me talk on other podcasts before, you know that I believe that tracking your glucose and optimizing your metabolic health is really the ultimate life hack. We know that cravings and mood instability and energy levels and weight are all tied to our blood sugar levels. And of course, all the downstream chronic diseases that are related to blood sugar are things that we can really greatly improve our chances of avoiding if we keep our blood sugar in a healthy and stable level throughout our lifetime. So I've been using CGM now on and off for the past four years since we started Levels, and I have learned so much about my diet and my health. I've learned the simple swaps that keep my blood sugar stable, like flax crackers instead of wheat-based crackers. I've learned which fruits work best for my blood sugar. Like I do really well with pears and apples and oranges and berries, but grapes seem to spike my blood sugar off the chart. I'm also a notorious night owl, and I've really learned with using Levels how if I get to bed at a reasonable hour and get good quality sleep, my blood sugar levels are so much better. And that has been so motivating for me on my health journey. It's also been helpful for me um, in terms of keeping my weight at a stable level uh, much more effortlessly than it has been in the past. So you can sign up for levels at levels.link slash health, get access to a continuous glucose monitor and the level software that helps you really uh, dial into a lot of these strategies for your life and your body. I mean, no one's had more of a front row seat to this than you with 3 million people in your community who I imagine are writing you every single day, telling them about the health transformations they've had from using your amazing set of hacks. So I'd love to hear based on what you've seen in your community and the different ways that you interact with your community, what are some of the most transformational changes that people have told you that they've had based on flattening their glucose curve. And maybe you can do the quick run through of your hacks. I know that there's the, the beautiful slides on Instagram, but maybe the quick run through of just naming them. And then like, what, what are some of the things that stick with you about what people have reversed? The, the best thing I hear is when somebody messages me like, Jesse, look, these are my lab results. A month ago, I had type 2 diabetes and I no longer have it. And my doctor cannot believe it. My doctor is like, how did you do that? So I love that because that shows me that you can be empowered with simple information and your doctor can actually be shocked because unfortunately, and you know this very well, a lot of doctors today, they are trained to diagnose and treat a disease with 
medication, they don't have the time or the training to actually understand from a lifestyle chronic perspective, how do you reverse these things? So that's my favorite, the lab results. They're like a month ago and now. And my doctor can't believe yeah. it. They're shocked. Yeah, yeah. Like, my doctor brought It's not Brian. rocket science. It's, it <laughs> is know, literally science. You know, you see like the, the movie, uh, the movie scenes where there's one doctor calling all the other doctors into the room, like, you know, Professor George, you have to come see this. And they're all, how did you reverse your type 2 diabetes? And you're like, well, just simple hacks, you know? So the hacks. Um, and so what I've done is, you know, I'm a scientist and I took all the latest research on glucose levels and I turned it into 10 simple tips. These are free. They are actually kind of common sense. But now from a scientific standpoint, we understand why they work so well. So top ones, have a savory breakfast, not a sweet one. Start your meals with vegetables. Never eat sugar on an empty stomach. Always as dessert after a meal, after you eat Use your muscles for 10 minutes, go for a 10 minute walk, have some vinegar, dilute it in water before a meal, put clothing on your carbs, have a savory snack instead of a sweet one, etc. That's the core. And these have led to so many transformations and diabetes is an easy one, but also, for example, women who had been on the birth control pill for their whole life, they get off it, they're not ovulating anymore. And the doctor says, oh, you have PCOS. And oh, in the topic of, you know, female hormones, education is not at all where it should be. And they don't realize that often PCOS is connected to insulin resistance. And actually too much insulin in the body creates too much testosterone in a female body, which can lead to PCOS and not ovulating and not being able to have a baby, et cetera. And so with the hacks, you can also reverse that. That's amazing. Have you had people message you and say that they've reversed their full-blown type 2 diabetes? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Every week. Every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Things that some doctors might never see in their entire career. Totally. And what I love the most is the doctors who use my work as a compliment in their practice. Yeah. They're like, hey, you have this condition. Read this book. Use these hacks. Come back in a month and let's see how you feel. Because ultimately, we're all on the same team. We're all trying yeah. to help people live better, be healthier, reverse their conditions. So that, that makes me the happiest Aww. when I hear feedback from doctors saying, Hey, I've been using your book in my practice for years and it's working. And That's I love amazing. that. Amazing. That's amazing. Well, I can tell you firsthand, it's not anything we learned in medical school, yeah. which is why, you know, this has been such an awakening for me. So how do we change me. that? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, you said we're all on the same team, but I mean, the pessimistic view of that is like, are we all on the same team? Because when you look at healthcare incentives and processed food incentives, you know, it makes you start to wonder, like, are we all fighting for health? You know, like if the healthcare system actually profits more when patients are sick, which brings me to this question, how has the healthcare industry, and I mean, I'm sure there's been different sort of segments that have approached your work differently, but how have doctors and the healthcare industry, and I'd be interested in how has the processed food industry responded to your work? Like what kind of feedback have you gotten? Support, pushback? I'd be so curious to hear. So in terms of the food industry, I haven't really gotten any anything because I'm not telling people never eat junk food ever again. I'm just like, if you want to eat the Mars bar, which by the way, I mean, I, you know, when I'm here in LA, I love Van Leeuwen's ice cream. And so I order myself like a big tub of the chocolate fudge brownie. I'm not anti processed foods. I just want you to know that when you're eating it, it's not good for your health. And how do you eat it in a way that's less damaging? So in terms of the food industry, nothing has happened. I don't think anything will happen because I'm not really yet going against. Um, in terms of the medical community, that's been a really interesting one. Many doctors have loved it as I explained and use it in their practice, but then some, you know, they see me show up. I'm 30 years old. I'm a woman. I have long nails. I have lots of Instagram followers. They're like, mm -mm, we don't believe that you have anything to add. You're not a doctor. I'm just a scientist, right? They're like, she's not a doctor. She's a woman. And the sexism is crazy. But to that, I'm like, guys, I mean, come on. You know, I just feel a bit bad that they have to respond so violently to my work because they feel so threatened. And then, you know, going past the personal thing, I'm also like, you're allowed to be critical of my work and to question it, but I don't want ever cynicism to turn into inaction. Because if you're an old school doctor who hates me just because of what I look like, that's not helping anyone. Ultimately, my work is helping people eat less sugar and eat more vegetables. So please give me a break. So that's what's up. But I, I like it now, actually. I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it live on TV. Yeah, I come for me, you know. At the beginning, it would destroy me, like a comment on a post that would like cry for two days. And now I'm like, bring it on. Because I know that what I'm doing is good. And I know and I have the support and I have the evidence. So I'm like, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, 
uh, show me your receipts. Like how many ty- cases of type two diabetes have you, exactly. like for the average endocrinologist, you know, have you reversed with high dose insulin yeah. and just more and more metformin and versus like, you can sit there and know that, that maybe thousands or more people have reversed PCOS, probably tons of weight loss, yeah, absolutely. type two diabetes, pre-diabetes, and just feeling better, feeling better, better sleep, better skin, better energy. Yeah. And sometimes I have a, I do something quite fun. I will ask a doctor why they think their patient has the disease. So why why do you think so if many glucose people are getting spikes don't matter? Yeah. <laughs> how does the disease? And yeah. there's there's just no. And I mean, it's based on the training. But then I think the problem is sometimes when doctors have had so much training, their ego has been so inflated that yeah. they just cannot think there's more to their training yeah. that needs to happen. And again, a doctor diagnoses and treats, and we need to complement that. With the latest science on food, how can a doctor have the time to read all these studies, right. you know? Right. And, you know, you hear that stat, it takes 17 years for research yeah. literature to get into clinical practice. I think that's ex- aggravated by the fact that sometimes the the research in nutrition is poorly done, so it doesn't make it into the, the research literature. But the beauty, I think, of glucose monitors and more accessible biomarker testing is that people now can just see if it's working in their own body. Exactly. You know, and, exactly. and not only, you know, not everyone needs a CGM, as you've talked about, but how can you tap into how you feel? And one more thing I will say is that, you know, we're talking about some doctors respond poorly, but also actually what I like to focus on is the thousands of doctors who are actually really taking on this information, using it in their practice. And that number is increasing every day. The number of like old school sexist doctors who don't want to hear about me, whatever, they'll die eventually. Like I'm interested in the new generation and in people who want to change stuff. Beautiful. So you have had such a front row seat to really behavior change. Cause I think most people following you, they want to eat better, have a better relationship with food and improve their health. So I'm curious, like in this whole journey over the past five years, like what do you feel like you've learned about people and what motivates people, what inspires people and what leads to lasting behavior change? I love this question. I think that's so wonderful because my passion is behavior change completely. I'm like, how do I get somebody from zero to one, because we all know we should be eating better, exercising more, but actually knowing something and then doing it, whoa, the canyon between that is very, very deep, okay? So what I've learned is that most people want to be healthy. And this sounds a bit dumb, but most people are not eating in a way on purpose to create disease. Most people do not know. Most people, when they grab a fruit smoothie at the coffee shop, they are thinking, this is going to be good for me because I feel like crap and I want to feel better. So that's important. The psychology, we have to remember that. And so I'm completely against like the blaming of like, oh, they're lazy. They don't know what they're eating. They're just making bad food, food choices because, you know, they don't want to eat better. No, no, no. People want to feel good. Okay. Number one. And then second, people hate diets. Diets suck. I hate diets. I wish we never had a single diet ever again. And people want stuff that is not restrictive, that is incredibly easy, incredibly effective, and doesn't make them feel like they have to give up a part of their life. Mm -hmm. And that's the hacks. And that's why they're a little bit magical in a way, because they hit all those marks. They're super simple. You don't have to restrict any foods. You can do them right now, right away. They're very, very, very easy and they have a huge impact on how you feel, right? Mm -hmm. So I think people want these kinds of magic solutions. And once in a while, there is science that comes along that actually gives you that solution. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think people want to feel good. And um, yeah, I agree. There's such a message in the conventional healthcare system around like patients being non-compliant and lazy. And if people wanted to be healthy, they would. And I've always really pushed back on that because the whole system is designed to make it easier and cheaper to make choices that are unhealthy. And then we get sucked into the addictive cycle of wanting more of that because of the dopamine reactions that you talk so much about. And so I do also so firmly believe people want to be healthy. No one wants their kid to be sick. No one wants to be sick. But we actually think that some of these choices that we're making are healthy, like the fruit juice, like just plain oatmeal on an empty stomach in the morning. And so some of those with the levels community have been really magic moments where like something they actually thought was healthy is not serving them. And they don't have to necessarily give it up completely, you know, like add a little bit of 
I will sometimes still add a tiny bit of juice to a full sparkling water yeah. to just give it a little bit of flavor. Yeah. It doesn't spike my glucose at all, like two tablespoons, but it makes it a lot more fun. What you said is super interesting. It's things that you thought were good for you, you actually realize with a glucose monitor, oh my God, it's creating a big spike. And I think it's important to categorize things into two categories. In one category, there's just stuff that everybody knows is bad for you. Like that Van Leeuwen's chocolate fudge brownie that I <laughs> delivered to my apartment at 11 p.m. I'm like, I know that's not good for me. I know that's a pleasure decision. It's because I want ice cream, okay? But the problem I have is with the foods that look healthy and are actually super damaging. So dried mangoes, fruit smoothies, acai bowls, you know, honey covered whatever. And that's where people get lost because they're choosing all these foods and the marketing is so powerful yeah. and there's so much money yeah. behind these companies. And that's really what I want to help people see clearly that that is not a health food. Yeah. That is also dessert. That should be in the chocolate ice cream category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just demystify that and get people more in a clear communication with their bodies. Yeah. I love how you talk about this. You've had such an incredible health journey and had issues with like depersonalization yeah. with your body and like how glucose fits into that. I'd be curious, just since you're talking about that sort of, you know, this, this confusion between us and food, how did that develop for you? Like how learning about glucose, learning how your body could speak to you actually helped heal some of these more, I would say, you know, psychological, mm -hmm. you know, symptoms you were having with your body. And I guess more broadly, like how understanding your glucose actually can improve our I don't know, deeper elements of our life, like our relationship to our bodies, um, maybe even like our personal development, like by and large. Yeah. Well, I have a very sort of unique story and, you know, there's no studies to support this, but this is just my story. So after an accident, when I was a teenager, I started having a lot of these mental health problems. So depression, anxiety, depersonalization, which is the worst thing in the whole world. And it feels like you're not in your body anymore in your hand. I mean, it's horrible. I really don't wish it upon my worst enemy. Not that I have enemies, but it's horrible. And so the problem was I was 19 years old. I was living in London. I was studying mathematics. Nobody around me was talking about health, trauma processing, nervous system. So I was just lost. And I was lost like this for 10 years with these episodes of depersonalization that will come on. And I had no clue what was triggering them. I was like, oh, I guess it's just happening again. And I felt so lost because you get to a state, you lose all agency and you lose all sense of control over your own life when these things come on and you don't even know why they're happening. And so finally, the thing that changed my life and why I became so interested in glucose is that I wore a glucose monitor. So this was 10 years later. And I didn't think anything would come of it because I don't have diabetes. The narrative had been glucose is for people with diabetes, no diabetes, no glucose problem. And what I saw, Casey, changed my life. One morning, I started feeling one of these episodes coming on. And I had just worn a glucose monitor for three, four days. I check my glucose monitor. And what do I see? A massive, massive, massive glucose spike to like 165. And something clicked in my head. I said, wait a minute, this spike is caused by what I had for breakfast 35 minutes ago. And this depersonalization episode is coming on at the same time as this spike. Maybe they're connected. Maybe the spike is causing something in my brain to react mm. to cause those symptoms. Now I understand it quite well. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, inflammation, very simply, you know, cortisol, stress in the body, bam, releases symptoms. And it changed everything because I thought, oh, wait a minute, maybe if I start looking at my food, I can already start helping my mental health a little bit. And that created the baseline for my health journey and my healing. But it took me 10 freaking years mm -hmm. of not connecting my lifestyle to my mental health at all. I was like, stuff I do, stuff I eat, and then mental health, no connections, separate entities. Mm -hmm. And that's also how you're trained to see them in the medical field. It's like, oh yeah, mental health. Okay, well, go see a psychiatrist, take meds for that, but don't look at what you're doing or eating or how you're living or stress or anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then you you showed this in such a large population in the research you actually did for your second book, yeah. the Glucose Goddess Method. Am I right in saying that you had 2,700 people go through your program that's presented in the book and yeah. you chose four hacks for the book that you stack week over week? I'd love for you to talk about what those hacks are, uh, why you chose those four, mm. and then what did the results show, Which mm. some of which touch on mental health? 
So in my first book, in the one here on the table, Glucose Revolution, there were 10 hacks. And after this first book, my readers asked me to help them get started even more. So I was already feeling that this was quite easy to, to use in terms of behavior change, but people wanted more. They wanted to know which hack to start with, how, and to have recipes. And that's why I built the second book, The Method, which is the four most important hacks. So we have breakfast, vinegar, veggies, and movement. I'm going to go through them. Breakfast. So the first and most powerful and most annoying for most people hack is the savory breakfast. So in order to have steady glucose levels for your whole day, you need to have a savory breakfast that keeps you nice and steady. So built around protein, whatever that can be, you know, it can be tofu, leftover smoked salmon, it can be eggs, it can be Greek yogurt, it can be protein powder, nuts, whatever. Then some healthy fats, okay? That's the base of your savory breakfast. You can, if you want, add a slice of toast or a whole fruit, but during a savory breakfast, we completely avoid anything sweet. So no honey, no jam, no fruit juice, no smoothies, no cereal, no muesli, no granola, etc. That sets you up for your whole day. And the reason in the method I start with this hack is because truly it is the most important one to start with. You're like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It gets you off their glucose roller coaster. Yeah. You can't really recover after no. a huge spike in the morning because you then can't. you're on, you're bouncing around for the rest of the day. So for example, this morning I had leftover salmon cakes some green beans and some rice and some cheese. And yeah. that's just, you know, I just treat breakfast as a normal day as we should. I had Brussels sprouts, ground bison from leftovers of last yeah. night. I threw some tricolored beans on top yes. and sauerkraut and avocado. So yeah, it's perfect. like, and it's like, yeah, it's weird, but like, oh, it's great. Good. Yeah. You feel amazing. <laughs> feel <full. laughs> yeah. Energy and now it's stable. 3, it's 3 PM and we feel amazing. Yeah. No crash. We don't need to drink a Red Bull, you know? Totally. So week one is savory breakfast. Then week two is vinegar. Now, vinegar is super interesting. And when I first discovered the science, I was like, huh, there's something here. You know, I thought it was maybe just another wellness fad. But in week two, what we do is that once a day, we have a vinegar drink before we eat a meal. Vinegar drink is super simple. You take one tablespoon of vinegar. It can be any type of vinegar. And then you dilute it in water, sparkling water. You can add, you know, some tea, some lemon, some whatever. Don't add any sugar, obviously. And this is really cool because vinegar contains a molecule called acetic acid that slows down the digestion of carbs in your stomach and reduces the glucose spike of your meal by up to 30%. So that's week two. That's a fun one. Week three is the veggie starter. Okay, so why the veggie starter? Because there was this one super cool study that showed that if you eat a meal in a specific order, if you eat the elements of a meal in a specific order, you can cut the glucose spike by up to 75%. 75%. 75%. It's crazy. It's crazy. And the correct order is veggies first, then proteins and fats, and then starches and sugars. And so from this hack, I extracted the most important piece of information, which is veggies first. So in week three, we create a veggie starter, and we have that at the beginning of one of our meals per day. It can be some sliced tomatoes with sea salt. It can be your super fancy roasted broccoli with tahini and whatever. Just some veggies, okay? That's week three. And then week four is the movement week. So use your muscles for 10 minutes after one meal a day. And you can go for a walk. You can clean your messy apartment if you're like me. You can play with your kids. You can do some calf raises because one of your muscles in your calf is very good at soaking up glucose. So you can do this at your desk at work. You do some calf raises for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Nobody will know. And you'll be reducing your glucose spike because as your muscles contract, they look for glucose in your bloodstream and they can use some of the glucose from the meal you just had. Mm -hmm. Now to your question about the results. So for any scientists listening, what I did was not a proper placebo control, triple, whatever, randomized clinical trial. We are just talking about an experiment. So for my second book, I recruited people off Instagram and I asked them to go through these four weeks and to tell me how it went for them and what happened. So after these four weeks, adding the four hacks, not changing anything else, not cutting out any foods, apart from the hacks, you can do whatever you want. You can drink your wine, you can have your chocolate ice cream, whatever. The results were amazing. After four weeks, 90% of people cut their cravings. 89% of people were less hungry. 70% of people had more energy. 
just with these four hacks. And then you have amazing stats like 41% of people with diabetes improved their diabetes numbers, 50% of people slept better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is so easy and so powerful. That is absolutely incredible. I can't even imagine how many tens of thousands of people that has touched, you know, this is just 2,700 people in your study, but you've sold 1.5 million books. So it's just yeah. crazy to think about how much positive <laughs> impact that has. I also wanted to mention, I remember from your book with the vinegar that mm. it not only ha can have a 30% uh, decrease in glucose spikes, but also like a 20% decrease in insulin. Yep. Is that right? Very important. Which we of course care so, so much about. about, right. Um, which brings me to another question. You are so deep in the metabolic health space. Other than glucose, mm -hmm. um, what are you tracking regularly in yourself in terms of biomarkers? I do once a year a pretty complete panel. Mm -hmm. Everything from insulin to ApoB to C-reactive protein to vitamins to hormones. Um, I track, I have this, uh, cooling mattress on my bed. And so that tells me my sleep cycles, but I don't, I don't really track it that that closely. Uh, but yeah, once a year, I just do a big panel. Right now I'm supplementing uh, with omega-3s, a vitamin B because I was deficient. My fasting insulin is great. I'm kind of just monitoring everything right now. I'm Love trying that. to get my ApoB a bit lower. It's not, it's not high, but you know, it's not the perfect optimal range. Yeah. So I'm always trying to make improvements, but I feel like once a year, I could even do it once every six months. But for anybody listening, I think the most important ones to measure are ApoB and insulin, fasting insulin. Yeah. Yeah. I agree so much. And then you're putting CRP in there, which of course is an inflammatory marker. You talk about this in the book that it's this swirl of inflammation, oxidative stress and glucose yeah. spikes and glycation and all of it that kind of work together. What to do create. you track? So pretty similar to you, I believe fasting insulin is the most important test that we can really do other than understanding our, our glucose levels, because as you've talked about so much, fasting insulin is going to change possibly long before our fasting glucose changes. So we really need to see that for that early marker of like, what's going on with this incredible hormone that's going to have a huge impact on our weight gain and all this stuff. So fasting insulin, um, triglycerides, I love uric acid as another metabolic marker downstream of fructose, yeah. because that's one that kind of hides several others. CRP, I generally do function health, which is 109 biomarkers for less than $500. And you never have to talk to a doctor to get those labs. So it's an amazing startup that's doing, making labs more accessible. And then I do the levels panel, which is just five key metabolic biomarkers more like every three months to just keep on top of it. So that's triglycerides, hemoglobin, A1C, uric acid, ApoB, and fasting insulin. So we try to make like what is going to be the most affordable, but maximal signal yes. for health. Biggest and bang for your buck. Biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. Because yeah, because $500 is a lot. And so for a fraction of that, we give people those five tests. So really I'm trying to, when I think about lab tests, it's, you know, it's different than I think what I was taught in medical school, which is like, okay, if this marker is high in the red, we need to bring it down. And if this biomarker is high, we need to bring it down. It's more about how do we look at all these tests and think of them, what are they saying about what's going on in the body on a physiologic perspective, on a cellular level? And then how do you read the tea leaves of what they're all saying together? What is this obsession with breaking things up into silos? Even you could say like already, you know, psychiatry and metabolic health are already split up, for example. But but then even within one panel that a doctor will provide to someone, they're also going to split up each thing and look at them as completely independent of each other. It's like this obsession with breaking things down into silos. Why is that? Yeah, I think it's got so many causes to it, but I think it, it, a lot of it goes back to the way that healthcare in the United States was set up from a billing standpoint. When we, when we really decided that we were going to bill things a specific way, we had to code everything with like an individual code. So it kind of trained doctors to think of the body and all these little separate parts and to code everything separately. So, you know, you can code for high cholesterol and you can code for high triglycerides or high glucose, like these different things. But like really what that means is metabolic dysfunction, yeah. but that's not something that we think about. So really it's like, it's just reading the tea leaves between all these things. So when I'm getting labs, another lab I love, 
love is GGT. It's, it's technically a liver function test. And I also love liver function tests to understand a little bit what's happening with like Mm -hmm. insulin and fatty liver and stuff like that. But GGT is an oxidative stress marker, which is never ordered. And so with CRP, which is inflammation and GGT, which is oxidative stress. And then of course, fasting insulin and fasting glucose is just telling me like, how much is a cell trying to block glucose from getting in together? I can get a sense of like, okay, what is that physiology that we talk about and that you talk about in your book of inflammation, oxidative state, stress, and glucose, what's it actually doing? So it's really like, how can I see inside my body? Like, you know, with these tests, as opposed to, you know, is it up, bring it down? Is it up, bring it down? It's like, what is it saying? So that's how I think about the labs. Isn't that going to be great when hopefully in 50 years, people look back and be like, do you remember what they were doing in the 2020s? Like how weird, why were they looking at all these things individually? I have so much hope. I think we're going in the right direction, but there's so much work left to be done. I love that. I love hope. Hope is beautiful. (laughs) And we're here in our like colorful outfits. We clearly have hope. But, um, so a question that a lot of people have is, is there anything when it comes to supplements that, uh, that actually impacts glucose levels in a meaningful way and in the right ways, like not just causing you to like squirt out more insulin, but actually improves yeah. metabolic health. And so I'm going to use this as a segue to talk about anti-spike formula, which you released when this episode comes out, you will have released it about a month and a half ago. So tell us about this new product and teach us a little bit about oh supplements. Oh my God. Okay. Let me tell you the genesis of this whole thing. So similarly to your listeners, my audience has asked me for a long time for supplements. And especially when it came to vinegar, a lot of people said, Oh, I hate the taste of vinegar. Can I take a vinegar capsule? Can I take a fiber pill instead of the veggie starter? So I put it off for a little while, but then about two years ago, I said, okay, it's time for me to look at this because I saw so much stuff on the market that was taking advantage of people. For example, you know, that one company that makes the vinegar gummies, with three grams of sugar in them. Okay, so I was like, it is time. The time is now, we must fight. So I looked at all the latest ingredient research and I found these very recently discovered properties of four plants, okay? And these plants have existed since forever, but recently scientists have found that they have an amazing impact on your glucose levels. The plants are mulberry leaf, sidebar, but mulberry leaf is what is given to silkworms for food, just just random, I think it's funny, but mulberry leaf extract, <laughs> lemon peel extract, antioxidants from green vegetables, and cinnamon. And so I put these all together into what I'm calling anti-spike formula. And this product does two things. It has an immediate action. So when you take it before a meal, it cuts the glucose spike of the meal by up to 40%, which is more than vinegar, and also the insulin spike by up to 40%. How does it do this? Yes. So the mulberry leaf contains a molecule called DNJ, and DNJ is so badass. So she grabs, okay, up to 40% of the sugar molecules from the food you just ate. And instead of letting them go through to your bloodstream, she brings them down to your microbiome. And so your gut microbes then feed on these undigested carbs very happily, creating short chain fatty acids, having the best time of their life. And you just ate your chocolate ice cream with 40% smaller impact on your glucose levels. That's step one. And step two, because of all the polyphenols, antioxidants, cinnamon, it has also been proven to reduce fasting glucose levels over six to 12 weeks. So helping people put their prediabetes, diabetes into remission slowly, and also increasing GLP-1, which is the satiety hormone that all the Ozempics, et cetera, are working on. So this is to me, if you're going to take one supplement for your glucose levels, this is by far the best on the market. Um, incredible science, also just beautiful because I'm obsessed with design and making stuff gorgeous. So this is your bestie. If you want a new hack to supplement the food habits you're going to be you know, putting into place, this is the one anti-spike formula. It's my baby and I love it. It is incredible. That is so fascinating about mulberry leaf extract. So in a sense, is it just, it's repackaging glucose in the gut into a different form that can then go farther down in the microbiome? Actually, DNJ acts on your enzymes oh, and it's an alpha okay. glucosidase inhibitor. So it actually prevents those enzymes from breaking down the carbs. And so the carbs just pass through to your intestine without having being broken down. Is that also the enzyme that's involved with vinegar? Is that or different one? Different one. Okay. Acetic acid. Acetic acid acts on alpha amylase. Right. This yes. is alpha okay. glucosidase. Uh, same concept. Same concept. Uh, but 
the vinegar actually slows down digestion and ultimately everything gets digested. This one actually prevents some of the smaller carb chains from being digested. I mean, it's all the same concept. It's all about how can you eat the sugar and then make sure it's coming into your bloodstream either more slowly or less. It's all the same sort of um, philosophical approach. That is so interesting. Yeah, there's been some... Um supplements that I've seen that I've dug into the research and it seems like what they might be doing is actually causing you to just secrete more insulin. Yeah, girl. And there's even studies showing that's the case for chromium and berberine. That's chromium. It's yeah. very bad because you can reduce glucose spikes by adding insulin to the mix, but that's like fixing somebody who has, who is going through alcohol withdrawal by giving them more alcohol. Like it's not, it's not going to help. Yeah. It, it may appear on the surface, yeah like it's working, but it's not actually solving the issue. And that's something we have to be super, super cautious about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the, so you landed on these four and then lemon yeah. peel. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of that one before. Yeah. So that's the one that contains the polyphenols that have this six to 12 week impact on fasting glucose, on inflammation, on HOMA IR ratios and on GLP-1. Then the antioxidants from the green vegetables, that's a custom blend I developed because polyphenols are so powerful and I really wanted to pack some in there. And then cinnamon has been studied, you know, but like for such a long time and has benefit as it adds up over time. But really the two stars and the two ones that have the most clinical trials that are the most recent and interesting are the mulberry and the lemon peel extract. Amazing. Is this safe for anyone to take? I mean, yeah, it's just plants. I mean, if you have a medical condition, ask your doctor. <laughs> but yes, it's it's vegan. It's just plants. And, you know, when you talk about plant extracts, it's like saying water. Well, there's lots of different types of water. There's water in lead pipes. There's water in a plastic bottle. There's water from a source. These extracts, I have chosen them to be the highest quality and the best types, most powerful extracts. So it, honestly, it is... There's nothing like this on the market. It's truly the best in the game and I'm obsessive and I've been working on this for a long time now and I'm so excited it's finally out. How soon before a meal do you take it? Right before, up to 10 minutes before. But basically you go like, mm, I'm gonna have a chocolate cake now and you go anti-spike, hop, and then you eat it immediately afterwards. Wow. Yeah. Have you tried it yeah, with girl. vinegar as well? Yes. You can actually stack the hacks stack if you it. want. You can yeah. do, they don't interact in any negative oh way. Gosh. So you can stack this with vinegar. You can stack this with a veggie starter. Yeah. That's the whole point. This is not, I know this sounds like a magic pill, but this should be an extra tool. For sure. Not replacing everything else. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm so excited for you. Thank Congratulations. You, I bet it is a big project to yeah. create your own supplement. So I'm so excited and, for you. you. Know, I'm just obsessed with all the little details. There's a little GG on the cap and everything. Just, I'm just... And there's really one other special thing that comes with it. Yes. So when you subscribe, you get the pill box. <laughs> so you can take... 15 capsules in your purse with you. I love it. And yeah. now everyone's bringing around their Vinegar dropper thing. bottles because of you. I know. Like everyone's got their dropper. I bet the stock of dropper bottles has gone up. You know, vinegar you. has gone up. And interestingly, <laughs> this is more powerful than vinegar. But, you know, then again, vinegar is much cheaper. So if you can't afford a $50 bottle, half cheap vinegar sure. from the supermarket, it also is going to help you. This is for those who can afford to buy this extra super powerful thing. While we're on vinegar, we're going to get to some listener questions at the end, but someone asked how long before a meal should you take the vinegar? <sighs> Several timings have been studied, 0, 10, 20 minutes. If you take, what I do is I try to take it maybe like 5 to 10 minutes before eating as a little pre-food cocktail, but also some studies have shown that even if you have vinegar during the meal, it also helps. So do whatever is easiest for you. Don't stress out too much, but if you can choose, like 5 to 10 minutes is perfect. Amazing. You mentioned mulberry leaf extract impacts GLP-1. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> I'd love to ask your perspective on the huge wave of GLP-1 agonists that are taking over the world. A lot of people think that this is the solution to the obesity and metabolic disease epidemic. What are your thoughts? Okay, thought number one, isn't it wild that we've created a food environment that is so toxic that now we need a pill to counteract what we're eating. It's wild. So that's wild. Second thing that's interesting. So GLP-1 is that hormone that tells you that you're really full. You know, after a big meal, you're like, I cannot. Even if your aunt is like, have some more cake. You're like, Auntie Susie, I just can't. One of the ways, you, one of the reasons to feel that way is because a lot of GLP-1 going around. And these agonists, like 
Ozempic, Wigovia, et cetera, what they actually do, and you, I know you know this, but it's really interesting, they don't actually increase GLP-1. They trick your brain into thinking there's more GLP-1 around, right? So you're not actually producing more of this satiety hormone naturally. Your brain is just being lied to. With anti-spike, what actually has been shown is that after six weeks, you have increased by 15% your natural production of GLP-1. Mm-hmm. So you're not tricking your brain into thinking you're fuller than you are, but your microbiome and all that good stuff has improved in order to help you feel fuller for longer. But like, listen, it's wild. I think it's incredible. Like for all these drugs, I'm 50% in awe. I'm like, wow. 50%... I wouldn't say I was going to go for like, you know, anxious about it. I don't know, a little bit saddened Mm -hmm. um, that this is what it's come to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It sucks. Yeah. It sucks. And again, it's big food and big pharma working perfectly in concert. And it does remind me a little bit of, for example, type 2 diabetes and, you know, insulin, all the diabetes drugs. It's taking a drug that's going to allow you to exist in this landscape of food that is so bad for you. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I love that you just, in response to that question, like named an emotion. I feel like so many people jump onto it with like the the facts. And I like, I love that. It just really resonates because I was thinking like, what is the feeling I feel? And you said sadness. I think I feel a sense of like disillusionment or disappointment that, you know, we have been blessed with like these incredible minds as humans. And we are somehow like not using our eyes and our minds to see what's really going on here, which like you said, is this perfect relationship between big food and big pharma. I would add in like big ag in some ways, like the chemical industry who like have over $10 trillion of vested interest in making us think that the solution is not actually quite simple, which is real food and in many ways, like understanding our glucose levels and stabilizing them. There are such big industries that have such powerful marketing and such a grip on our mainstream media. You know, 60% of news networks advertising comes from pharma. And so that we have somehow as a population sort of been blinded to the reality of what's happening, which is that a totally toxic food system and a healthcare system that has poor incentives have driven us to think that, that these things on our plates are normal and they're not, they're poisoning our biology. It's like the simple analogy of if you had a fish in a super dirty fish tank, would you clean the fish tank and put the fish in fresh water? Or would you just put chemicals and medicate the fish? (laughs) It seems so obvious when we say that. And, but that's exactly, I feel like what these medications are doing. Capitalism, money, 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 girl. And it's not as simple. There's this wonderful guy, a Chris Van Tulik, and he just wrote a book called ultra processed people. And I'm going to butcher this, but he explains basically that it's not as simple as just saying, oh, you know, tax this food, uh, tax the food companies, tax ultra processed foods, because actually, for example, our pensions are dependent on those companies doing well. Right. So there, it's a whole it's not just like, oh, they're bad, um, prevent them from doing stuff. It's like, no, it's actually integrated into everybody's lives. And so we need to actually work with the food industry to create products that are less harmful, but are still making money because it's still a business and it's still a situation where they need to show profit to their shareholders. A lot of them being, you know, you and me. Yeah. Well, I think that's where, um, there's such a brilliance in what you're doing because by spreading awareness to people about, you know, what is really going to serve their health and their bodies, waking people up to these things. And then, like you said, with the behavior change, gently moving them into it. So it's accessible. It's not, you know, it's, it's a gentle path towards getting to all of a sudden where you just like, don't crave these unhealthy foods. Well, what that then leads to is consumer decision-making being different and people wanting different products, wanting healthier, real foods. And I think in many ways, that's going to be the quickest way to change some of these huge companies because they're going to accommodate consumer demand. So it's this cycle. And I think it starts with awareness. And I changed a little bit my view on this because when I first started, I thought the only thing we need to do is educate the consumer. And now I'm realizing, yes, that's very important, but we also need to act at the systemic level and actually push regulations so that food companies cannot advertise to kids, super ultra processed foods cannot put on a 
full of sugar cereal box, good for you, healthy for your heart. You know, we also need to make sure that there's checks and balances in that situation. But it's we need to do both. Yeah. And I learned that from 23andMe, actually, by giving people access to their genetic data and their genetic insights. You're educating the consumer and the people. And then they go to their doctors and make better decisions. And it's work from the top and the bottom at the same time. Yes. And that gets into some of this incredible work that you're doing that I don't think that many people maybe know about, but like you're doing incredible advocacy work in well, the UK. Well, it's just starting. But it's, it's just so starting. cool. Can well, you tell us a little bit about yeah, Bite Back? For sure. Listen, at the moment, I'm just getting into meetings, understanding what's going on. So there's really cool um, organizations in the UK that are fighting for better legislation, that are trying to create policy change and are trying to let the government understand that we need to push these agendas, for example, the advertising to kids or the health halos, et cetera. Um, I'm just learning, but there's a few organizations that I love. One is incredible. It's called Bite Back 2030, and they are educating teens on food marketing. And they are calling out the fact that the NHS, for example, National Health Service in the UK, in their official app, they recommend processed foods as good things to eat, like a like a chocolate mousse dessert or an energy drink with lots of sugar in it. So they're doing super awesome sort of calling out work. And right now I'm not doing much. I'm just resharing their work and trying to drive to their programs. But I am loving this. I think it's amazing. And I'm so excited to use my platform in the future to do more of that. It's just going to be championing stuff that's already going on, that's right? Amazing. And using my platform and my followers and my voice to be able to bring attention and more support to these initiatives. That's so cool. Yeah, I was looking at the Bite Back website. And Very cool. It's cool. And, you know, it's teenagers teaching other teenagers I know. about how they are being manipulated like suckered, you yes. know and i think i'm gonna just butcher this i don't remember the publication i don't remember the year anything i just remember the kind of moral of the story this study i read years ago that was about high school students and how you get them to eat healthily and it's like it's not educating them it's not yelling at them from their parents it's not you know it's not like forcing it it's really two things it's like, what are their friends doing? So if like friends or community and sort of like, you know, family habits. But the biggest one was if you can make them feel, especially teenage boys, like they're being used by the system and like suckered and like profited off of, it sparks this sense of like rebellion. Yeah. Like, so to get kids to basically not eat from the vending machines, the best way to do it was to tell them how they were basically like being used for other, in a way that they didn't really realize. So like, I, I love that. It's kind of like getting it. Like if you can incite that sense of like defiant yes. rage and, and that motivates me so much. It's actually been something that's really helped me. I've never been a big drinker, but I'm kind of at a place in my life where I really want to just like stop drinking alcohol and starting to think about like, wow, like the alcohol industry has normalized this. And in a way they're like taking my life force, like every time I choose to drink and like taking away, like if my, let's say like my main goal in life, which I would say it is, is like spiritual development like what how is the alcohol industry convincing me that it's actually not taking away from that something about that energy that i kind of got from the bite back website like feels very exciting like get kids to be kind of pissed off at how they're being taken advantage of yeah. i don't know absolutely absolutely so. and we should all be kind of pissed off about all the misleading marketing and the food halos and there's nothing that pisses me more off than going through the aisles of a supermarket, all the dried foods and all the organic, no added sugars, vegan, you know, gluten-free. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah. Oh my gosh. I love it. We're hearing what pisses off glucose <laughs> goddess. Okay. Question for you, you and your team, I'm sure are constantly scouring the research for what's the latest in the metabolic health research. So I'm curious if there's any exciting research that's come across your desk recently that might like make it into a new hack in the future, or is there anything that's like exciting to you about the metabolic health research right now? I think over the past few months, there's two things that stick out. One has to do with coffee. Yeah. So if you've had a poor night's sleep, if you're tired, okay, if your system is tired, it is better to drink your coffee after breakfast than before breakfast. It helps regulate your glucose levels better for the rest of the day. Now, small study, 20 people, still quite interesting because we know that coffee can increase our stress hormones. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something we can always apply, which is coffee after breakfast instead of before, when we can. Mm -hmm. And the other one that I'm super excited about has nothing to do with food. It's showing us that actually our glucose levels can be impacted by practices. For example, by grounding. 
So grounding is the process of putting your bare feet onto the ground. So it can be the grass, it can be the beach, it can be just the, or the ground somewhere. And this reduces inflammation in your body and lowers your fasting glucose levels. So in the study, they ground people for like, I think it's two hours, 10 hours, 15 hours. They do it with this funny machine where the bed is actually hooked up to a socket that actually grounds the voltage. But you can do this just by going for a walk barefoot somewhere. That I'm very excited about. And I think, you know, mental health has always been such a strong passion of mine because of my own issues. And I think in the future, I want to focus a lot on that and the brain and how can we teach people hacks similar to these food hacks, but in the mental health space. But also, how do we visualize that? Because one of the strengths of my work is that you see visually the glucose monitor data to explain the hacks. So I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to show visually the impact of something on your nervous system. Because HRV, I mean, you can show HRV, heart rate variability, but it's not super exciting. I don't know. Ooh, that is fascinating. Or is it the brain? Do we show Do we show some activations of different brain sections? Do we show skin voltage? Like, I don't know. I'm. This is my jam. I'll, I'll let you know when I've figured it That's out. That's beautiful. Ooh, so something down the road with For something sure. with visual Asia. I was just, when you were talking, I was thinking like something you have done that is so amazing is really proving that point of like a picture is worth a thousand words. Yes. Cause what, you know, I think really kind of broke you onto the scene was showing the your grass. glucose curves yeah. and you could literally give someone, I think a hundred scientific papers saying yeah. that like vinegar and, you know, alpha amylase and it's like one picture yeah. could be the thing that changes it. One thing I love so much is there's this organization in the UK that uses my graphs um, with their uh, community members who are trying to reverse diabetes. And they sent me a letter saying, Jesse, your graphs have been used by people who cannot read and who have mental disabilities, but with just the pictures, they've been able to understand, and that is the best. I could even remove the words from the graph would and it would it. work. Yeah. And I just love that. Oh my gosh, that's so It's so cool, right? Beautiful. Yeah. Speaking of that and the sort of mental things, like I think that a lot of people, and I have been in this boat before in my life, are gripped by their cravings, and cravings are basically dominating a lot of their mind share in their life. Can you just talk a little bit about basically the relationship between glucose spikes and cravings and what you've seen in your community with people essentially like changing the way they feel yeah. about sugar. A couple of things. A really interesting study showed that when your glucose levels are dropping, it activates the craving center in your brain. And it's something that you cannot really fight against. It's a biological reaction to glucose levels dropping. And when do glucose levels drop? After spikes. So if you eat in a way that creates a spike, then about 90 minutes later, you're going to have this drop. And that's going to tell you, Casey, eat a cookie, right? <laughs> and that's something we've all felt. And it's hard to fight against it. And the solution is not actually to fight against it. The solution is to try to fix the underlying issue of the glucose spike. So using the hacks, for example. And then what happens is that when you eat something sweet, sweet, you're still getting this very enjoyable dopamine hit, you know, the pleasure molecule in your brain. But if you get it with less of a glucose spike, you're going to have fewer consequences on the cravings roller coaster. So all of a sudden, when you eat your cookie, you're not setting off a 12 hour craving marathon where every 90 minutes you want more sugar, but instead you're enjoying it for the pleasure without the follow on roller coaster and cravings and sugar addiction. And that's the key, right? It's not about cutting out sugar. It's about eating it in a way that doesn't create more cravings for the rest of the day. That's the key. And that's freedom. Yeah. You have a story in Glucose Revolution about a woman who never left the house without snacks. Oh, yeah. And I literally have been there. I remember in medical school when I think I was much more on the glucose roller coaster, it's like I always wanted a fun size candy in my purse just in case I had a craving because cravings, they grip you, you know? And so it's beautiful that, you know, there are these strategies that aren't about deprivation that can help people like ease that. And yeah. It's just also so interesting from also like that bigger picture perspective of like so many religious traditions, spiritual traditions talk about like how craving and wanting and attachment is like the root of suffering. And I bet a lot of people relate to that, that like their cravings are causing them suffering in some way. And that it's almost like this interesting relationship between like glucose hacks and actually like that mm. bigger picture sense of like non-attachment to Love food. It. I mean, is that something you know that, the concept yeah. of the hungry ghost? I don't know that. Yeah. The hungry ghost is this spiritual concept that says that you're always going to want more. It's this ghost that lives in you and you, you feed it food, you feed it food, but it always wants more. And I think, you know, I used to experience this with, for example, like the number of followers on my Instagram account. I was like, I just want more followers. And at some point I was like, whoa, this is, I'm never going to be fulfilled. There's always going to be more followers 
to get. And that's the hungry ghost, right? And so if you're able to really be conscious of this, then you become freer. But in the case of cravings, because it's coming from this ancestral part of your brain, it's not just awareness that's going to help you. <laughs> that's going to help you reduce it. You have to fix the underlying issue. I could literally listen to you talk all day. You are amazing. Oh and I know we're going to wrap up here. And so two more, two more things I want to chat about. One is some personal questions about you. And then the oh, next yay. is actually listener questions that um, we I asked on Instagram, what people wanted to know. And I got so many responses. So we'll go through a couple of them. So the first question is just about what it's like being glucose goddess. I, one of the things I've admired about you since day one, and I actually feel like has evolved even over time is that like you bring your full self to this work, full expression, the orange shirt, fabulous hairdos, got this beautiful fashion sense. You are showing up as yourself as a 30 to 40 woman. It's so cool. Even though you're in this scientific field. So you're definitely like bucking some standard norms and it's, and having this massive impact. But I just was so curious to ask you, like, where did this come from? Like, how did you develop this sense of confidence and self to just like bring all of you to your mission. There's stuff that I, I never showed my personal life online and people don't know, you know, where I, where I live, where my friends are. So I've sort of carved out the part of me that I feel like one is helpful to the mission and two that I want to put out there. So all the other stuff I just don't show. Right. But listen, I think it's cool to make science sexy. I think it's cool to create contrast. I'm obsessed with contrast. I think that's where magic happens. Like we need contrast. And so if you, you know, talking about blood sugar and also, you know, going to fashion shows and doing that, that excites me. And that's just personal. And I just dig it. And so, you know, okay. So I, I haven't said this publicly, but now these days I'm so comfortable doing podcasts. At the beginning I was terrified for everything, but now I'm comfortable. And so the main thing I think about when I go on a podcast now is like, what am I going to wear? <laughs> <laughs> And I don't think about it in a sort of, um, I think about it because I think it's important. How do I want to show up? How do I want to create this universe, this glucose goddess, the emotion? And, you know, I, I walked in and you saw I was wearing a white t-shirt. Then I changed because I thought, well, with this backdrop, the orange is going to look cool. I just love that part of it. And I'm not forcing it. It's just, I love that. And I, I have so many more things I want to accomplish in that space merging. You can be a cool fucking scientist or a cool fucking doctor. And you can also be super hot and wear all the latest stuff. Like why, why do we have to be scientists or doctors? doctors and look like crap you know we can be cool we need to be on the cover of magazines we don't need just actors and models and singers like we need female scientists i have so much passion for this and of course people will say that i'm crazy and uh, i get a lot of criticism but i just love this stuff that's the passion and i'm doing it for the 13 year old jesse who saw on the cover of magazines just the singers and the models and the actresses. And I was like, you know what? This generation, we're going to show that you can be a scientist and have brains. I love that so much. And I think at the end of the day, like it feels like it's impact. People love it clearly. And you have so many followers and billions of people watch your podcast. So it's like people can kind of say whatever they want. Like you're having this monumental impact. And it's just like, that is, I love that. It's so inspiring. <laughs> Obviously it's the glucose hacks. They're just changing their lives. I think there's probably some other element that's getting to people of like people in medical school, people getting their PhDs, people who are interested in science who are like, Oh, I can actually be exactly who I am and yeah. it's totally okay. Yeah, so yeah. that's beautiful. I never changed myself. I probably actually turned up the volume on myself more. Cause I was like, if I'm going to be on social media, Boom. you gotta be loud. Yeah. Like, let's go. Stand out. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Boom. Yeah. Rain and rainbow so filter. Fun. Like, let's go. You know, this yes, stupid rainbow the filter. Rainbow. I know. <laughs> Obsessed. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. Second question about you. And then we'll get some listener questions. I can imagine with your world right now, there are like endless opportunities coming at you. Like write another book, do a documentary. Like I can't even imagine, make a supplement, like be on these podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. What is your framework right now for like how you're thinking about what to say yes to and what to you're say gonna no love to. it you're gonna love it <laughs> intuition how does it make me feel when sometimes I'll get an opportunity and like my first response is like oh my god this is so big but then I don't feel good and I cry and I'm stressed out about it and now I've learned that if I feel that way that's not good like do not go there if it feels stressful if it feels like it's slightly constricting me in a way that I don't want to be constricted I'll just say no and it's so hard because I'm such a people pleaser it's been a journey um so it's intuition it's is this going to impact my freedom because I love being free. 
Yeah. And sometimes it's worth it. Yeah. But for example, I recently got this opportunity and it was like a three year project. And I, f I felt like that's just too long. I don't want to yeah. have to sign up to something so weekly for three years. It just didn't feel good. Ooh. Mm. So intuition, when you were answering that, it sounds like you're also talking about body knowledge. Yes. Like what is your body telling you? And yes. I think there's a lot of people out there who have trouble feeling what's going inside. So how did you develop that intuition? Well, originally I was confused because sometimes I would, you know, even when I was younger, before glucose goddess stuff, I would be, for example, offered a job or something. And the person offering me the job was this very scary person making me feel like shit, you know, and offering me a really bad salary. But I was like, oh, they must be right. You know, they must know more than I do. So I should take it because, you know, they're older and they're a man and blah, blah, blah. And now I'm understanding that if it doesn't make you feel good and happy and excited, you just don't go there. You just don't go. If it makes you feel bad, you just don't go. And it goes for relationships, for friends, for as much as you can. I'm a master editor of my life. Every week I'm like, what do I need to edit this week? Boom, boom, boom. And I will just, I just do it because I know that in order to create, I have to be really good about my boundaries. Yeah. So how did I develop it? Uh, time and practice. And it's so hard. Oh my God, it's so hard. It's so difficult. Sometimes you have to say no and be like, hey, listen, I thought about it. I'm not going to say yes to this opportunity. And it feels so scary, yeah. but then I'm super happy. Yeah. So you just have to practice. It's a muscle. It's like today I might be com comfortable doing podcasts, but at the beginning, my first ever podcast, I was sweating so much. Probably had a glucose spike. Totally. <laughs> I was like, I was in shambles. You just have yeah. to keep doing the thing that scares you because that's where the growth is happening. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. Gosh. I mean, it's like. It's also amazing coming from a scientist. You're like, mm. it's intuition. Like yeah. it's not a spreadsheet. No. Like it's into, it's how you feel. It's developing body awareness. Um, and yeah, I mean, sometimes I think I struggle a little bit with like, I very much trust my intuition as well. And that's a big driving force in my life right now. But then I wonder sometimes when my intuition says, no, I don't want to go near that. Is there any like limiting belief, fear in that? Because sometimes it's an emotion, sometimes it's intuition and you don't know which one it is. Yeah. So to me, the intuition is sort of um, quieter and it's not always the first reaction, the first big feeling. It's more like the feeling when you're alone the next day and you're in the shower, you know, it's, it's quieter. The you whisper. Have to, yeah, the whisper. It's the whisper. And sometimes I do stuff that I feel my original emotional reaction is like, this is so scary. I feel like I'm going to die. But I still do it because the deep down whisper is this is good growth. This is going to bring you somewhere. Yeah. You see what I mean? And maybe bring you even more freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> such wisdom. Oh, stop. I don't know shit, but listen, oh. I tr who knows? We're all trying to figure it out. I love it. Thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> and thank you for just, yeah, candidly sharing about that. Okay. A couple of questions from Instagram. Numero uno. What about dairy? Confusing. <laughs> Treat it like sugar or no, because it has sugar. Yeah, dairy has lactose in it, which does create a small glucose spike, but that's not where you need to be worried. I don't think that's at all where you should be trying to optimize. I have dairy, I handle it very well. Great source of protein, healthy fats. I mean, if you're going to switch from, for example, whole milk to oat milk, I would say no. Yeah. You know, if you don't want to drink dairy because of X, Y, Z reason in that case, you know, go for unsweetened nut milks, for example. But I don't have a big problem with dairy, personally. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. I used to think it was dairy that was causing my horrible jawline acne mm. in my 20s. I had acne until I was 30, like everywhere. And I thought it was like, oh, it's the IGF-1 and it's, you know, but I think it was just my blood sugar was yeah. problematic. So when I got my blood sugar and my insulin under great control, I can eat full fat and I do focus on organic and all that. If because, you can, but even yeah. if you can't, it's okay, it's, you know? Yeah. I think I have a much better response to full fat, of course, because it's like putting clothing on the, exactly. the glucose. Because the if you remove the fat from dairy, you're not changing the fact that there's a little bit of sugar in right. there. Therefore, you're just allowing the sugar to arrive into your bloodstream much Faster. quicker. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. This is an interesting question. How to eat to get a faster metabolism? What is a fast metabolism actually? Uh, it, it, this term, I think a lot of people think of fast metabolism is like you can eat whatever you want and stay skinny, right? What do you think? I think we need to get rid of the term fast metabolism yeah. because the way I think about it is like a fast metabolism is 
a really well-functioning like metabolic system and mitochondria and you can build that, right? Like if I think about like a mitochondria that let's say one of the things that makes a mitochondria work properly is micronutrients, right? We know that you need like B vitamins and magnesium and a bunch of other micronutrients to let the electron transport chain work, right? So like if you're super micronutrient depleted because you're eating a fully processed diet, I would guess that your enzymes in your mitochondria aren't working properly. So maybe that means you know, your slow metabolism, slow metabolism, but there's like a hundred other things that make mitochondria function differently, like cortisol levels and what your microbiome is doing and the short chain fatty acids they're creating. So I think it's more like thinking about cultivating a fast metabolism. And I'm sure there are some genetic elements to that, like how your mitochondria work and whatnot. But, but it's like, I think this binary, like I do or don't have a fast metabolism is wrong. It's like, how do we actually really, what we're trying to do is build better mitochondrial function. And I don't another know. important yeah. one is metabolic flexibility, right? The yes. ability to go from being dependent on glucose to being dependent on fat or to being able to burn glucose or fat. So I think a lot of people, when they say I want to fast metabolism, they're like, I want to lose weight. I think that's what they mean. Um, and in that case, if you want to lose fat, the one of the easiest things to do is to get your insulin levels down, right? And to use the hack so that glucose levels reduce, insulin levels reduce, you're less hungry, you have fewer cravings, you burn more fat. Mm-hmm. And then really, I think people should focus on having a flexible metabolism so that you can go six, seven, eight hours, 10 hours without eating and you don't have this, you know, low blood sugar. You don't need the snack in your purse. But the cool thing is that when you focus on glucose, a lot of stuff falls into place. So what, whatever you call it, it will get better. Here's a final question, which I think I imagine will end on a hopeful note, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> so, <laughs> can I undo 40 years of poor food choices? Can I still heal my body now? Absolutely. I see people who are 85 years old who start the hacks and a month later they're like, wow, this is the first time I actually feel good in my body ever. Your glucose levels and your body responds instantly to what you do. At no point will what you eat and how you live not impact how you feel. There's not a point where you've gone so far that whatever you do, nothing's going to change. It's not true. Things change instantly. They react to how you eat, how you move, how you manage your stress, how you exercise, how you sleep, who you're around. Like even being around people, you you feel differently depending on their energy. Well, food goes inside your body. It impacts you immediately. So it's never too late. Um, and please try the hacks. In a couple of days, you'll feel better. I love it. Thank you so much, Thanks, Jesse. Casey. To end, tell people, obviously they know where to find you because everyone listening, I'm sure already follows you, but share about your website, your Instagram, and when when and where they can get anti-spike and any other exciting things you want people to know about. Okay, so Instagram is kind of the hub glucose goddess, glucose goddess, <laughs> and that's where everything happens. Anti-spike is on antispike.com, A-N-T-I-S-P-I-K-E.com. I have two books, Glucose Revolution, which is reads like a scientific novel in a way, but it's really, really fun. And then the Glucose Goddess Method, uh, which is the four hacks of four weeks. I have a recipe club. You'll find that also on my Instagram. I got lo- loads of stuff in this universe. Uh, hop over to Instagram and see what see what sticks. Amazing. And I feel like you've been really excited on Instagram about your recipe club. Yes. What, what, tell us a little bit about that. It's just encouraging people to keep going so once a month you receive 10 recipes that i create it's three savory breakfasts three veggie starters three main dishes one snack beautiful glucose goddess approved to help you continue to do the hacks and that's really good because when you receive them at the end of the month you're like oh yes let's try a new recipe let's make it easy i'm a super lazy cook so everything is stuff that takes five minutes six ingredients and is delicious <laughs> <laughs>